I, I realize this is not, you're not going to be able to read all of this from the back there, but I thought I would, if we just focus for a moment on the second point over there. 1826 in Barton in the United States, okay? A 21, I think she was 21 or 22 year old woman uh, had a femur, something like that, which she had fractured as a child and it had malunited at a very odd angle. And so she walked with a, a skew, a limb, and so on. And back in 1826, um, a surgeon opened up the side of the thigh here, yeah? refractured the bone, straightened it out, and stitched it all back up in seven minutes. Okay, this is all recorded in seven minutes. But the really extraordinary thing about that is it was done with no anesthetic whatsoever. Now, I go back to my previous point, which is that there are three things that were required to make that an acceptable thing to do to a human being. I mean, we would say now that that's just extraordinary, that one could even contemplate doing that. Moving on from that sort of approach, uh, when it came to the development of artificial hip joints, and this, by the way, is a plastic, uh, a plastic bone, it's not a, it's not a real <laughs> bone. <laughs> There's some nervous people here in the front row. It's a plastic bone, uh, uh, but this is a real um, artificial joint, that, uh, a titanium joint, I think, which has been implanted into that. But the development of orthopedics and the development of the management of orthopedic infection over the last 100, 200 years has involved a lot of experimentation which wouldn't really uh, pass uh, the sort of tests that one would subject research to these days. And one of the things that stands out about the research on, on bone and joint infection and on orthopedics is that what people tended to do was experiment with the substance of the day. Okay? So the first, um, so when, when, uh, when Bakelite, you might remember it was electrical stuff and so on. So when Bakelite was invented, artificial hips were tried with Bakelite. When ceramic, uh, when pirate's glass was first invented, someone said, well, let's make artificial hips out of Pyrex glass. And that's exactly what they did. Now, when they made Pyrex hips, uh, uh, hips out of Pyrex glass, they didn't make one or two Pyrex hips for one or two Dobermans, okay? They implanted, and it's written up, they implanted 500 artificial Pyrex glass hips. Um, what do you think happens? Right. Sorry? Crack. They crack. Uh, and that's not the worst of it. They crack, they splinter, and the glass goes everywhere. You can't get it out. I mean, it's just a, it's a disaster once it's cracked. Um, but pretty much, what about um, Vitalium? 500 Vitalium. Who's anyone here with Vitalium? You want to know what Vitalium is? It's a dental amount. So I think it was invented in about the 1940s, and, and so some hips were constru uh, constructed with um, Vitalia. Um, but all I'm trying to illustrate is that between then and now, orthopedics and bone infection went through a pretty empirical history of trying to work out what to do for human beings. I'm showing up this slide, which is not the x-rays from the young lady you saw dancing on one foot but a very similar sort of um, x-ray. And this is the process which uh, my colleagues, surgical colleagues Martin and David would um, undertake on the unit to, I'll just think, illustrate here, if that is an infected bone, what they would be doing is they would excise, they would make a cut there and a cut there, take out up to 10 centimeters of infected bone, put it in the bin, there's nothing quite so, so successful in terms of getting rid of infection as actually putting the entire infected bit of bone in the bin. Of course, you're left with a problem. There's a space. Um, and this technique, which was in fact uh, designed by a Russian, is a technique which is designed to support the limb with titanium rings on the outside, as that young lady had earlier up there. Uh, and then by the patient gradually adjusting the uh, screws on this, it's a, it's a kind of boy thing really, I'm not sure the girls really like it, but anyway. You can migrate ends of the bone together whilst pulling apart other parts of it, and eventually you have a fully united 
um, bone. It's an enormously successful uh, mechanism for getting rid of infection. Now, if we move to the history of the treatment of infection in general, hand washing became important. I'll get to talk a bit more about that. Florence Nightingale and her pra best practice in hospitals, that was important, the discovery of bacteria back in 1866, antisepsis I already mentioned, the discovery of tuberculosis and the eradication largely of TB uh, in the first world, and the development of, the, of surgical techniques and their clear description, along with the development of x-rays and anesthesia. These have all been really important landmarks in the development of orthopedic surgery. Uh, and that's been uh, accompanied by, at least in the first world, by the development of very high living standards, a childhood vaccination program that has been enormously successful, the development of antibiotics, and I will tell you a bit about their problems, uh, and eradica eradication <coughs> programs that have been partially successful in malaria, pretty much, a com uh, and then completely successful um, for smallpox. And there's another infection which is about to be eradicated called rinderpest, uh, which mostly affects cattle, I believe, rather than human beings, but all the police to know. Um, but just let's look at what's happened in the last 100 years. Infection-related mortality. So that is the number of people who die as a result of infection in the last 100 years has gone down from almost 400 to about 10. I mean, that's an enormous success story. If you look at it, the mortality after childbirth, in 1901, recorded in the UK, 2,000 women died as, as a result of infection complications of childbirth. In 2000, two people died. If you look at polio, it's a disease that has been eradicated, and the number of deaths is none now. Now, arthroplasty. Arthroplasty is the uh, term for the Imparting an artificial hip joint. I thought I might uh, pass one round. Does it work? Perhaps I, I realize possibly some of you have one and you might not want to hold one. Can <laughs> I pass one round? So this is a. There we go. Uh, it, uh, so that is a, is a, is a metal and ceramic um, artificial hip joint. It's worth a few thousand pounds. <laughs> Um, and of course it's become an enormously successful medical um, intervention and it's become the choice of, uh, a choice of intervention for patients over the age of, well it used to be say, said 65 and then 60 and then 55 and now 50 probably, for osteoarthritis in the first world. An enormous number of people will have a device like this implanted. I think I read recently that if you look at the UK population over the age of 70 now, 5% have at least one artificial joint. It's an enormous number. So we'd better be sure that most of them don't become infected. Because if they did, that would be an enormously large number of infections. Now, in this country, there are about 75,000 artificial joints going in per year. About 1,500 infections per year. This country has just over a thousand consultant orthopedic surgeons. Now, you can do the math on this one. How many infections per consultant orthopedic um, surgeon per year? Let's assume a thousand are doing the operation. Well, that's about one and a half infections per year. What would you conclude from that? Good technique. Good technique. Good technique. Good technique. Right. <coughs> so in other words, it's a very successful intervention. But there's a downside to a very successful intervention for one and a half infections per year. And the downside is that that individual consultant orthopedic surgeon, uh, when they um, do get a patient with an infection, they are not going to say a good technique. I can assure you, the language is probably going to be a lot more colourful than that. 